Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, as I am each and every month, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Craig Joseph. He's the Chief Medical Officer for Nordic Global, and uh, we are talking about news you can use uh, for uh, this month. Craig, thanks for joining me. Uh, as always, my pleasure to be with you. And uh, I, I understand that you're not in your uh, normal uh, uh, sound enclosed studio. No, it's uh, it's almost a throwback Thursday kind of uh, experience because when I first started podcasting, I used to do this live. Um, and in fact, I'm in one of those live experiences right now. I'm in an airport. So if you happen to hear some background noise, um, uh, there will be no prizes for guessing which airport I'm in. It uh, uh, really doesn't matter, but uh, it's... Uh, uh, the necessity of a selective use of the mute button to try and minimize as much of that. Um, and that's really uh, one of the primary topics uh, that uh, I thought we would uh, start talking about was the uh, increase in travel and literally just recently the extension to the mask mandate. But unlike previous extensions, it was only two weeks and I actually did an unofficial poll with uh, some folks. I like to get the sort of consensus. And interestingly, the consensus was very much it was going to be extended. I was in the camp that thought that this was really uh, past its uh, time, uh, but it's extended. But interestingly, only two weeks. Do we uh, see this possibly uh, disappearing? And what are your thoughts about it? I know I have some thoughts about it. Yeah, well, and I think that we uh, we disagree a little bit uh, um, on on whether we're going to wear masks when we don't when we don't have to. Uh, I think that what's happening now with regard to the mask mandate on the on airplanes and, and in airports and and buses and trains um, is that the CDC is uh, buying time, right? Um, what is going to happen with this new? Uh, uh, variant that um, has kind of been sweeping England and it uh, should be starting to come up and, and affect us. Um, and so far, fingers crossed, seems to be that uh, we're okay. And, and um, uh, it doesn't seem to be significantly changing um, hospitalizations or, you know, people getting very sick. And uh, I suspect that the CDC says, you know, we need two weeks to, um, to figure, just to be sure that uh, that this um, this um, you know new variant is not going to cause us any serious problems. Because can you imagine what would happen, Dr. Nick, if they took away the mask mandate and then uh, three weeks later uh, reinstated the mask ma mandate? And I suspect that would be uh, that would cause a few problems. I, like you, have been on a lot of airplanes recently. It's really, um, so to speak, taken off for me. And uh, um, people are, are, in my experience, are, are wearing the masks and, and not complaining, but uh, boy, the uh, flight attendants and the pilots are just pushing it real hard. And, and that, you know, um, by pushing it really hard, I mean, hey, we don't like wearing these masks either. So please don't uh, uh, take it out on us. And I think everyone has gotten that message. And I think it would be a real shame if we uh, took away the mandate and then had to bring the mandate back. Um, I, I would, if I were a betting man, I would not bet a lot of money, but I would bet a small amount of money that uh, in two weeks, uh, it will be, it will be reversed and uh, there will be no more mask mandate. A very small uh, amount of money. Well, so uh, the consensus here would be, um, you know, lifting of the mask mandate, but that implies in this instance that you think that, uh, the stats are not going to impact the decision making. And, you know, my question around this, and you're right, we do uh, disagree a little bit. And I will tell you that I've sort of seen both ends of the spectrum on travel. I've seen the sort of, you know, relaxed approach. Let's be honest, it is impossible to drink and eat whilst wearing a mask. I, I, I don't use a straw even before COVID, I hated straws and I still don't use them. Um, and eating is a, a whole thing. And I've seen, you know, 
very aggressive uh, implementation of this mask requirements, uh, you know, asking people to put the mask back up between bites, between sips. Um, and I know people take a little bit of liberty, but ultimately, you know, the difference between one end of that spectrum and the other is essentially people's response. And I think what you're doing is you are alienating the population with a policy that has started to really impact. And the other thing I, I've got to say, I'm my my tears are falling as I look around me and I see young children who struggle with interactions because they cannot reconcile faces, um, you know, and, and interact in the way that they need to, especially at the young ages. Um, so I certainly hope so. But the other thing I would say relative to that assessment of, you know, whether we should or shouldn't is, are we measuring the right thing? So if we measure cases, we can continue to find cases potentially because it seems like there's a new variant and, you know, but is it causing us additional uh, trouble or, or uh, you know, death um, or, or morbidity and mortality? And I'm not so sure that that's the case. And I also don't think bed utilization necessarily fulfills that purpose because if you went pre-COVID, bed utilization was extremely high because that's the way the system is designed. So, I'm not sure how we titrate this and if the mandates are the right way to approach this. Well, you're right. Uh, uh, infectious disease expert that I uh, I follow, I think today said we're, we're not measuring serious disease, we're measuring bad colds at this point um, uh, among the majority of the population who have either A, already been infected and survived, and B, uh, or B, have been um, uh, immunized, um, plus or minus also, also being infected um, by Omicron and Delta before it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do think uh, people are a little gun shy about taking away some of these things. We've seen a major city, uh, I think it was Philadelphia, was it Philadelphia or, uh, yeah, Philadelphia, who, who had taken away a mask mandate and then uh, reinstated it because their numbers, their case numbers were going up. Um, and that, you know, you could just, I, even I, a proponent of mask wearing when in large crowds around um, people who, who seem to be coughing. Um, and and uh, even I would think that it's not going to be good to be bouncing back and forth. And, and that's what we were kind of teasing about our disagreement. I said that I thought that I would be wearing a, a surgical, a paper surgical mask, um, which is, you know, fairly loose fitting and um, and it doesn't hurt my ears. I would probably be wearing that for a while in airports and on airplanes. I too, like you, even though I know the science says uh, the airport's really the gross place, right? And the and the um, the airplane is pretty safe. Um, uh, you know, uh, heck, I would just appreciate not getting sick, not getting sick with colds. Forget about COVID. And um, and 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 so when I'm in a large crowd. I will probably, uh, you know, bring a mask. And when I sit down to eat, um, as long as, well, if I sit down to eat, then that means I'm not wearing a mask. And, and I still think there's some, there's some, uh, there's unquestionably some benefit. The question is, what are the, you know, I think we're in the area, we're in the range now where people are just going to make their own personal decisions and, and acknowledge that often those decisions are not going to be based on science or hard data, right? Um, hey, I just want to wear a mask because these three people uh, over there, sitting over there, are hacking up a lung, and I, I, I don't, I know statistically they don't have COVID, they just have colds. I don't want that. I don't want that flu. I don't want whatever it is that they got. So I'm just going to wear a mask, and that's okay. Um, you know, uh, that's not that was stigmatized. I think that stigma's gone, and um, um, you know, I, I, I hope that people are just able to to do it. Some people. Uh, are much more rigorous about washing their hands than others. Um, I think we all are, live on a, on a spectrum of, of where we're comfortable doing, and, and, um, and that's okay. And, and whether the science supports it or not, if someone wants to be a little bit more, um, you know, wants to be a little bit more careful and um, slightly decrease their risk of getting a cold, and that's that should be that should be fine.
Yeah, I think that's, you know, fair point. And I think the uh, issue of personal responsibility, I, I, I like your concept around, you know, the, the freedom now to put on a mask. It's interesting. That might be the new response that would be extraordinarily acceptable. You know, previously you'd be in a, an elevator or a lift, as I would call it, and somebody would be coughing. And you might be a little bit awkward about that, but now suddenly we'll see people pulling out masks. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. putting them on in in front of the person, you know, and that's virtue signaling at its uh, premium version, I think. So hey, uh, that's I, good. I was I was uh, literally on uh, two airplanes yesterday, coming home, and um, uh, of course I'm wearing a mask in the in the airport as I'm as I'm required to in the United States. Uh, but there were people sitting around me waiting before the we could board the plane who were coughing, and I was just giving them the death look. Um, I tried not to, but I did on the inside for sure. I was giving them the, you know, the death look of that, that um, requires your death look to be visible from your eyes only, of course. Yeah, is, no, is that really the case? It didn't. I don't think it was effective, Doctor Nick. But um, but I, I was just like, oh, they're gross. Now I was not thinking they're going to kill me with their COVID. I wasn't thinking that because I, I, I just thought, hey, you know, they clearly are are sick, and I don't want to be around them. And I'm glad. I'm glad I'm wearing this surgical mask. Um, and, and I realize that they can still get me sick. <laughs> I realize that, but the chances are lower. And, and uh, that, makes me feel, that makes me feel a little bit better than if I were just sitting, I would have had no other recourse than to stand up and move. Um, and so, yeah, that, I, I do think that that, and we've seen that you know, in people from um, Asian countries, right? I think we've discussed this, had been wearing uh, surgical masks uh, in airports and on air, on public transportation and actually in the public um, for decades. And it's not a stigma and people kind of just shrug their shoulders and, and move on with their day, not understanding nor caring to understand why uh, the person next to them is wearing a mask. Um, and so, yeah, yeah and we saw... We, we saw the benefit for, for, for sure in the first year of the pandemic. We saw zero, almost zero uh, flu cases as a direct consequence. I mean, no, no, no question in my mind of all of the mask wearing, social distancing. So I, I think all good things. Um, yeah. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today I'm joined as I am each and every month by Craig Joseph. He's the chief medical officer with Nordic Global. We're uh, discussing news you can use, talking about travel, um, mask mandates being extended. And in fact, uh, the, uh, they did renew uh, the public health emergency um, uh, status, which is slightly different. I, I think that's more about reimbursement and payment for activities. Uh, I think that's gone out for another three months. I mean, obviously, we still have many uh, potential consequences of uh, the, the COVID disease, including long COVID. I've seen that with some uh, friends that is very significant, um, obviously entirely appropriate. And I think, you know, I wonder if that will continue to be extended or will we find some better way of sort of supporting uh, people through um, uh, that disease process? Well, when I think you're right in terms of, you know, uh, I think uh, most People who travel <laughs> will realize very quickly when the uh, when the mask mandate and for public transportation goes away. I suspect most Americans will not be uh, think that they're uh, as affected when the public health emergency goes away. However, I would argue that the public health emergency is actually much more important uh, day to day for um, for the public. And and so you know what are we talking about? Certainly reimbursement. So. Um, certain things that were not allowed prior to the public health emergency um, are. We're talking about telehealth, though, right? So it's not just reimbursement. That's sort of reimbursement. But um, the, the relaxation of rules that have been in place um, that, uh, hey, if you want to talk to a doctor, uh, they have to be in the same state as where you are physically located. Some of those have been, some of those laws and rules have been, have been relaxed and would instantly go away with a, uh, with the public health emergency gone. Um, also, some of the handy dandy uh, rapid tests that we use are approved by the FDA uh, via emergency, via uh, the public health emergency powers. And when that public health emergency is revoked, all of a sudden, a bunch of these tests that are out there no longer have the FDA's permission um, because they didn't have, they didn't, weren't able to go through, um, you know, dot all the I's across all the T's. 
Um, also, there are, um, I, I think we're getting close to the point where it's, it's not relevant, but some of the vaccines that are out there um, have been approved, kind of uh, have not gone through formal approval yet. Now, I, I, I think that that's not true. Uh, I'm certainly not the expert here, but I think that's not, I think that um, the, the big ones for adults have all been now formally approved, but uh, some of the extension of those to smaller children are based on smaller data sets and with less experience, because obviously they just started doing the testing um, much more recently. So, so there are effects that are going to come uh, when that public health emergency um, goes away. And I believe the government promised uh, all of us, uh, but mostly the industries that are affected, that they would have prior notice. And so it's not, they can't give us a week or two and just say, okay, it's going to stop. Well, I guess they could, but it would be um, very bad. Yeah, so I, I think great points. I mean, those are significant things that I, I don't think we can afford to lose. So um, hopefully there's some plans in place, but uh, three months down, you know, there's an awful lot of kicking the can down the uh, the road uh, in politics, it would appear. And I think we need to address things a little bit more uh, long-term uh, in our approach, particularly with public health. Subsequent to that, um, there's been significant impact on the clinical folks and we're seeing strikes looming in California. Uh, I believe 93% of nurses voted to come out in Sutter. There's a bunch of others. Do you think we're going to see more of that? Well, you know, we've all, there have been nursing strikes um, Occasionally, there are physician strikes um, uh, long before COVID. Uh, but all the reasons I think that they were striking um, are, are there in, and more numerous than, than ever before. And, and so, yeah, um, the pandemic has really done a number. And I don't think the, that the public really understands the, the significance of the effect. Um, of the pandemic, just based on the amount of work. We're not even talking about what the virus, I'm not talking about the virus affecting uh, nurses and doctors, of course it does, um, as, as everyone in, in the population, but um, uh, fewer and fewer people are, are, are carrying the same or heavier load. <laughs> and that doesn't, that can't keep going. Um, and now nurses have seen in particular that uh, perhaps they've been underpaid uh, for, let me think about this, forever. Um, I am uh, uh, not an expert in, in pay for uh, any clinician. Um, however, we've seen that uh, nurses that they travel, which really becomes, uh, they're, they're not no longer an employee of a hospital, but really a contractor. Um, uh, that's always been an option. Hospitals have always looked for uh, some nursing and other kinds of clinical staff who they needed for a specific reason and they couldn't hire fast enough. Uh, but now um, the, the same nurse could could almost go across the street to the hospital across the street and significantly improve their their salary, um, not benefits because they're not they're not employees, but their their salary uh, significantly improve that, which makes them think, well, wow, this is actually what we're worth. Um, and so I, I suspect you're right that the this uh, going on strike, renegotiating contracts, um, demanding benefits um, is only going to go up. And um, as a as a nation, we're going to have to see how we can how we can deal with that and and, and pay for that. Yeah, and and it extends beyond nurses, but um, and other clinicians. And I've certainly seen in other countries. I, I don't know about the U.S. whether there's been strikes, uh, you know, across other clinical domains. There was in Australia prior to my working out there. It had a massive impact. It was very quick in terms of effectiveness, and I think was helpful in sort of establishing that value proposition. But it's it's more than clinical. I mean, I think of you know the likes of. Uh, supermarket workers who, you know, we all suddenly discovered were essential uh, parts of our community and delivering a service that, you know, we just take for granted, but, um, you know, we're on the front lines, but get minimum wage. And, you know, that's not a living wage for many folks. I think it's a real struggle. So, yeah, we expect much more of this. And, uh, it, you know, that leads into sort of a follow-up to our discussion from uh, last month. We talked about Redonda. Um, uh, the nurse in uh, uh, Vanderbilt that uh, has been uh, convicted uh, and is now uh, a criminal 
uh, for making a medical mistake. Um, we talked a lot about that, but um, I think the feelings continue to explode. I think it adds to that overwhelming nature. And, you know, you talked about that specific group and the fact that they have been underpaid, overworked, they've had additional work loans. And now we've seen, um, you know, an additional stress or uh, on that community and beyond. I think it doesn't stop at the uh, nurses. Uh, I, I just, I, I am so troubled by this. And I've seen certainly the other position. I think you and I both share the uh, uh, the view that this is not the way forward. Uh, I've seen others who say, well, she made mistakes and, you know, multiple instances and so forth. But that's not the whole story, is it? Absolutely not. And I think, you know, we, we all start with the conversation with someone died and, and um, someone died that um, uh, would not have died directly um, due to a, a medical error. And these things are very rare, but they do happen and they're devastating. Um, and so, you know, we have to acknowledge that, that, that tragedy. Um, that said, this is exactly why uh, um, nurses uh, specifically at critical care of ICU nurses, um, are saying, why am I doing this again? Why, why, why am I taking on this responsibility? Uh, I am human. I am going to make a mistake. Uh, we've all made mistakes, doctors, nurses, therapists, we've all, we've, pharmacists, we've, we've all made mistakes. Um, but often, most of the time, almost always, either we catch them or someone else catches them before they lead to a, a serious problem. And so this, this is an, a rare thing. Um, I, 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 I think what you're alluding to is that the, the whole story was not, well, a nurse made a mistake and um, she shouldn't have done that and someone died and she must not go to jail. Um, there are systems in place that are supposed to help decrease the chance. You're never going to go down to zero, but significantly decrease the chance of making a mistake. And you know, some of those, as we've um, as we've read about what what happened here, neither of us has firsthand knowledge. We're all we only know what we're what we're reading. Um, but you know, they, there were there were systems that were that were functioning beforehand and are functioning now that were not functioning then at, at that hospital. And so, you know, for instance, there was no ability to do barcode med administration, which is where um, the nurse would take an order that was in the system. And um, would take the uh, medication out uh, um, through the through the medication um, uh, cabinet, and would uh, use a barcode reader to scan the patient's ID band, so we know we have the right patient, and then would uh, barcode uh, read the the medication, which is usually in a pouch or if it's an ampule, it's got a little barcode on it, and then the computer would be able to give a big thumbs up, uh, a green check mark to say, yeah, this is the right patient and this is the right medicine. Uh, the right dose, the right route, and the right time, the five rights. And so that, that's a system that's in place at most U.S. hospitals and in, in, in most units that was not working due to, as I understand it, technical problem. Um, when the nurse went to the uh, med box to override, which again does not typically happen in non-emergencies, um, the system didn't function the way that I think uh, many of us would have hoped. Um, she typed in uh, uh, the beginning letters of the brand name of the medication she wanted, which was Versed, V-E, uh, but the system was programmed not to acknowledge that there's the existence of brand names, even though it's a very common for doctors and nurses to use the brand names, um, and it, it only showed her a list of, of uh, generic names, and the one that started with V-E was Vecuronia, which is a paralyzing agent, and she mistakenly picked up that, that vial. So we could go on and on to talk about, you know, what are some of the specific technical things that should have been there in place to help prevent, to help uh, um, ID that this was, this was going to be a, a problem. And they were not in place. And we were counting solely on a human who we've already established as overworked. Oh, and by the way, she was training another nurse. So she had multiple things going on at the exact same time. Um, and it's just a, it's a, you know, we talk about the Swiss cheese effect when all the holes, all the layers of, of uh, the safety net um, all have to line up just perfectly for a mistake to kind of go through. And that's exactly what happened. And um, I hope that uh, um, everyone acknowledges that if we just count on humans to never make a mistake, um, we are going to be sad and have many more funerals and have much more 
um, morbidity and, and medical problems than, than we should if the systems were in place. Yeah, I, I think that eloquently states it. I would say, you know, as somebody else, I'm quoting someone else here, that, you know, a culture of safety is one in which the system uh, that allows a mistake to happen is changed, not one in which the individual is scapegoated. And ultimately, a culture of safety correlates with better patient outcomes. You know, we're getting the opposite with this based on what I'm hearing. And I think you described very clearly multiple points of failure that you know are not attributable to a single and and certainly you know the lack of intent here uh, is a huge deal for me but um, unfortunately as usual we've run out of time um, just remains for me to thank you as always for making the time uh, and uh, uh, joining me on the show Craig. Thank you it's my pleasure and uh, safe travels to you. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution.